Hello and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. This series is made possible thanks to a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. Filling in for Chris, my name is Kendall Bainash and I'm a Development Coordinator at Mercy One Des Moines Foundation. It is my ple pleasure to introduce the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer, Dr. Richard Deming, who will introduce our program for, for tonight. Dr. Deming? Great. Thank you, Kendall. And you guys are in for a treat tonight, as I am, because we have a good friend of mine who is a guest speaker. And one of the silver linings of COVID is that we had to go to Zoom meetings. And one of the silver linings of Zoom meeting is that the speaker doesn't have to actually show up at the Mercy One Health and Fitness Club at 530 on a Wednesday night. He can be halfway around the country, and he is. Dr. Richard Wender is the chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health in the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And I really got to know Rich uh, when he was for seven years, the chief cancer control officer of the American Cancer Society. And I have to tell you that um, Rich taught me uh, about social determinants of health and has uh, been a real influence in the way I look at healthcare in the United States, healthcare around the world, and how we can create a system that provides better healthcare and better health, even more importantly. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my friend, Dr. Rich Wender, and uh, he's gonna talk about social determinants of health and cancer. Thanks, Rich. Uh, thank you so much, Dick. Uh, what a real joy it is to be here. And uh, it does make it easier. Uh, but uh, let me be clear, folks, if Dick Deming asked me to fly across the country and meet with you and I in person, I would do it because uh, he's one of my real uh, heroes and role models. So uh, right back at you, Dick. Uh, you know, uh, let me start sharing my slides. Uh, so let's There we go, and it's got the right, the right setting, the slideshow. Hope everybody can see that well. Let me, someone speak up if we can't. Looks great. Fantastic. So, uh, you know, it's interesting, Dick. Uh, you know, at this, it, it feels like our world over the past year has been centered around political divides. And when we come together to talk around about health, something that we're all committed to, that we all believe in, on some level, you you'd say, can't we, can't we make this not political? And it's not my intent to give a political talk, but instead to show that we, we, we've, I think we're finally realizing we just cannot separate out uh, the policies, the world we live in, how we've gotten to where we are today with social determinants, uh, and, and the results of that, of how they impact people that we care about, that we care for, uh, that we live near, uh, uh, and, and the communities uh, embedded in our cities in rural America. Uh, we call those factors the social determinants of health, and I'm really delighted to have a chance to share these thoughts. Now, I appreciate, I'm not going to take the whole time for presentation. I look forward to talking to, with you through, through the chat function and with Dick uh, at the end. Uh, with that, let's do it. All I have to do is make sure my slides advance. There we go. So I want to begin by asking you this question. What do people do when they find out that they have cancer and they get a recommendation for management? Do they accept the first treatment recommendation they receive? If you're a cancer survivor, did you or your family member accept the first treatment recommendation you heard? Or did you ask other people for advice? What did you do? What do you think I should do? Did you search the internet? Do you think cancer patients in general search the internet? Did you take it a step further and actually get a formal second opinion? If so, did you do it in your hometown, your home city, or did you travel out of your home city or maybe even out of state? And I want you to ask yourself, based on those choices that you have made or would have made, had you been living in a different community with different resources, 
would you have had the same options to approach a, a cancer diagnosis the same way? So with those questions lingering in your mind as you ponder them, let's launch in. So if you decided or someone decides to get a second opinion or maybe to go to a center that isn't close to where they live, I would understand why. Because the revolution in cancer care is absolutely real. You know, and I've said to people probably four or five times in my career, I said, this is it. You know, we have a breakthrough. And then we've often been disappointed, particularly for adult cancers, the common adult cancers, that the advances didn't really result in the, in the reductions in mortality and prolongation of survival. But that is now changing. This revolution is real. It's immunotherapy. It's, it's biomarker testing guided targeted therapies where we now die. Uh, even the diagnosis of cancer is less based on your organ where the cancer started and more based on its molecular signature. And as a result of this, for the first time, treatment is now contributing to declining mortality for the common adult cancers. We previously made progress for childhood cancers. Uh, and the survival incre is increasing for virtually all cancers. Look at the trends in cancer deaths uh, since the 90s. They've kind of been flat or even going up a little bit. Uh, and now we're seeing steady declines in mortality. Here's what it looks like for men. And I want to particularly draw your attention to this rather stunning rate of decline in lung cancer deaths. And most of you should know most of this reduction is due to tobacco, reduction in tobacco use. But this final drop is a combination of tobacco, and we now, thanks to Becky Siegel, the American Cancer Society, and others, have proven that this is also due to advances in therapy for the first time. I'm a little worried about uh, th these prostate cancer curve, which is kind of flattening out, and that's because we've abandoned screening a little bit, uh, but steady decline in colorectal cancer as well. How does it look in women? Same thing, a real acceleration in mortality decline for lung cancer. Breast cancer still coming down, colorectal coming down very dramatically. In fact, if you look at the uh, declines in death rates for the four major cancer killers in adults, uh, lung cancer 48% in men, 23% in women, colorectal is now up to 55% overall, although not so much in younger people, breast cancer 40%, and prostate cancer over 50%. Not just is mortality declining, but as I mentioned, look at the extension of five-year survival rates for virtually every cancer. The one exception more recently is urinary bladder cancer, but for every other cancer, uh, even pancreas cancer, we are seeing uh, steady increases in five-year survival. Uh, so this progress is real. Here's the issue. Not everyone is benefiting equally. And as a result, we've seen dramatic disparities in cancer incidence, cancer survival, and cancer mortality. Uh, and in some areas, those disparities are increasing rather than decreasing, although overall, all we are seeing a decrease. So let's ask a simple question. What are disparities? Very, very straightforward. Uh, health and healthcare disparities refer to differences in health and health care between population groups. Disparities uh, occur, uh, let me just take this out of my way here so I can see the whole slide. There we go. Uh, across uh, uh, many dimensions, uh, including race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, location, gender, disability, and sexual orientation. Uh, all of these are predictors of disparities. So thanks to work by Amadine Jamal, Becky Siegel, and others at the American Cancer Society, uh, who really are the leading experts in the, in the world on measuring these trends and looking at disparities. Um, let me show you some of these differences in progress against cancer that uh, measured against certain parameters. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of these slides looking at the difference between the black population and the white population. I read recently, by the way, that the preferred uh, way to now write white is with a capital W. There's some very interesting articles about that that I was just reading today. I did not do that in this presentation, so I'll do that going forward. Um, and there's some, again, very fascinating, worth reading what, what the rationale is for that. Um, 
the uh, and the reason I focus so much on black white to a large extent is because that is the most frequent way in which the big data sources are reported. I guarantee you, and I'll show you this, that if I had the same set of data based on socioeconomics or education, you would see even larger disparities than we see black white. So my focus on black white is because that's where the data comes from. I will show you a little bit about the Affordable Care Act. So you can see that cancer death rates by race and ethnicity uh, are not equal. Uh, you see non-Hispanic white on the left of the slide, the highest rates in non-Hispanic black, particularly black men, uh, lower for uh, other groups, somewhat related to the age distribution of these populations. Here's the key take home, and it is counterintuitive. Disparities in, mor in mortality ultimately result not from a single factor. They result from a sequence of failures to equitably deliver care, from screening to diagnosis through treatment and follow-up. These variability in delivering very specific elements of care and in the quality of those elements of care cumulatively result in disparities, and I'm going to prove that to you in a moment. So. You would think that as our ability to screen and diagnose and treat uh, improves, that you would see disparities go away. And I want to prepare you for this counterintuitive uh, conclusion. In fact, as improvements in our ability to screen, diagnosis, and treat improve, disparities increase. And in fact, disparities are the lowest in the cancers for which we have the least to offer. Kind of counterintuitive, but I'm going to show it to you in a moment. So I mentioned earlier that although a lot of these data are, are based on Hispanic, Black, White, Asian, uh, these, this particular graph is comparing the uh, mortality uh, outcomes based on not just Black, White, but also years of education. And the point of this slide is to show that there are much bigger differences between those with under 12 years of education and those with more than 16 years of education than there are as to whether somebody is white, black in every education category. So if all of the data that I'm going to show you today were based not on black, white, but instead on, this had a life of its own, uh, instead based on uh, education achievement, you would see even larger disparities than I'm going to show you. Uh, there have been a marked change in the percent of newly diagnosed patients without health insurance since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you'll, you see some reduction in uh, uninsurance rate across the board because people in every state could buy insurance through the exchanges. But the biggest reduction in uninsurance were in states who expanded Medicaid versus com compared to those who did not. So from a health percent, uh, uh, cancer perspective, expansion uh, of the Medicaid program made a big difference in outcomes. Uh, same thing occurred in screening. Uh, if you look at screening rates, comparing uh, states in the solid line that expanded Medicaid versus those who did not, you see quite a dramatic improvement in the states who expanded Medicaid. Uh, uh, in the case of colorectal, it was pretty equal prior to expansion uh, and, and a marked uh, uh, divergence of the two lines following expansion. So here we go. The more we have to offer, the greater the disparities. And I'll show you why. So here's really the key slide that kind of proves this point. If you look in the 70s, there was essentially no difference in mortality between black and white women for breast cancer, no difference in mortality between, uh, for, between black and white uh, individuals for colorectal cancer. Today, there's a 45% disparity in mortality. I think that recently came down to 40% for women, 40% in for breast cancer, and 40% gap in mortality for colorectal cancer. So we went from having no gap to having a 40% gap in mortality. And the reason is, is because we developed so many good ways to either diagnose early or treat these cancers. I also made the argument that this is not any single factor. It's a series of failures at every step. So uh, if you look at the uh, 
stage distribution, which reflects when people are diagnosed. Uh, black is in red, white is in blue, uh, and black individuals are more likely to be diagnosed with advanced disease, both for breast cancer and colorectal cancer. Uh, this is a cumulative probability of developing colorectal cancer between colonoscopies. It's, it's the number of months since your first colonoscopy, and you can see that the interval cancer rate is substantially higher, and it starts to diverge within a year, uh, black individuals and white. And this is a marker of lower quality colonoscopy. So it's not just a matter of having a colonoscopy, but quality matters, adenoma detection rate. How about survival rate based on stage? Once again, uh, the uh, survival rate uh, for white individuals at every stage, whether it's localized, regional, or distant, and for both cancers, is higher for white individuals than for black individuals. Uh, so again, the treatment failure, screening failure, lower quality. And this is a very concrete example where trastuzumab, which is the generic Herceptin, clearly indicated for certain stages and people with tumor markers. So this is the rate of delivery of trastuzumab in people and women for whom it was indicated. And you see, again, that at every stage, white women were far more likely to actually receive the recommended treatment than black, failure at every stage. Uh, we also see greater delays in adjuvant chemotherapy uh, in black versus, uh, versus white, Hispanic, and Asian. Uh, again, failure at every step, quite a substantial delay. So the, the hard concept to get our heads around in this period of revolution in cancer care is that innovation can actually drive disparities. This is an article by my colleague, Chris Latham, who I've worked with in lung cancer. He was mainly talking about lung cancer, but it applies to all cancers. Quote, without adequate access, as personalized medicine becomes standard, there's a possibility that cancer treatment outcomes could worsen for underrepresented populations, even as treatments improve for the general population. In order to alleviate some of the area-based and facility-based disparities in cancer care, collaborations with community centers are needed and new models of care delivery are necessary to allow all patients to have access to the latest approaches and developments in cancer treatment. Innovations can drive disparities. So now that we've shown that disparities exist, we've shown that it's a failure at every step, uh, let's ask the even deeper question of what explains these disparities. Because in my view, we've become numb to them. Uh, everyone listening to me tonight, particularly if you're in healthcare, have seen countless talks showing slides similar to the ones that I just showed you, whether it's for heart disease, lung disease, for cancer, for diabetes, with black populations, lower educated populations, experiencing greater disease burden than majority white population or wealthier population. We see them across every disease state year after year. I think our past year has changed the discussion for disparities, and I believe that change will be permanent. COVID-19 brought new focus to health disparities because we not only observe the disparities, we could see right in front of our eyes almost every day why they were happening. Black and Hispanic populations were disproportionately impacted by COVID. And we saw why, because they were more likely to be working in essential jobs. They were more likely to need public transportation, to be living in crowded homes, to have less access to outdoor space, less ability to work from home, less access to health care. They were more likely to suffer from chronic conditions. They had higher obesity rates, and I could go on. We saw all of these things play out in front of our eyes. None of these factors, even the obesity rates, are inherently biological. None of these factors are necessary attributes of being Black or Hispanic. And describing disparities by race or ethnicity actually fails to capture the most important aspects of the story. Uh, and Lau and his co-authors made this point just last month uh, in their article about income in inequality in COVID. Lau and co-authors found that higher levels of economic inequality 
were associated with a high level of instance and mortality from COVID. This didn't matter if you were white or black. He was looking at income. Quote, high levels of income inequality may harm population health, irrespective of racial ethnic composition. That's true across all disease states, but again, played out in front of our eyes with COVID. So given that there are these non-biological factors, the real question is, how are we going to tackle that? Uh, it, it's tough to tackle once a patient shows up with advanced cancer, already faces barriers to care. So I would argue to, tonight that connecting with our communities, tackling the root causes of disparities, establishing trust, working with partners from all sectors, including the business sector and the government sector, are the only pathways to achieving true equity. We, you'll, we're going to talk tonight, and I will use the term the social determinants of health. But I must admit, uh, on some level, my preference is to talk about the social determinants of health as the true determinants of health, because medical care is critical, uh, but it's not nearly as critical as factors like the quality of schools, educational achievement, affordability, stability of our housing and our food supply, access to good jobs with fair pay, social support, discrimination, and the safety of our neighborhoods. These factors, when combined, have a far greater impact on health. So here's a nice summary of the social determinants of health, and I promise you, uh, I am going to break down the slide for you, but we're not going to dwell on these too much. You're pretty familiar with them, I suspect. Um, so economics, neighborhood, education, food, community, and the health system. So for economic stability, we look at employment, income, expenses, debt, medical bills, and level of support. For the neighborhood and the physical environment, housing, transportation, safety, parks, playgrounds, walkability, and the local geography, education, literacy, language, early childhood experience, vocational training, access to higher education. For food, hunger, and access to healthy options. For social context, social integration, support systems, community engagement, discrimination, and stress. And of course, our healthcare system. Are you, do you have healthcare insurance coverage or not? Provider availability, linguistic and cultural competency, and quality of care. These are what, together, what we call the social determinants of health. Um, our ultimate goal is to strive for equity. And you'll hear that term equity. I want to just dwell on it for a moment, if that is, in fact, our ultimate vision. To achieve equity in cancer outcomes would mean that everyone has the opportunity to prevent and survive cancer by addressing the obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences including powerlessness and lack of access to quality health care, good jobs of fair pay, quality education and housing, and safe environments. That's what it's going to take to achieve equity. These are slides that the Robert Wood Johnson has put together. There's quite a number of versions of them, but I like this one the best. Uh, equality is making sure that everybody gets the same access to services. So at the top, each of these people got the same bicycle. We treated them all equally. That will fail to achieve equity, however, because it does not take into account the barriers or obstacles that an individual faces. To achieve equity, we need to tailor our investment and, in fact, invest more in those people who face greater barriers. So the disabled person needs a very unique form of bicycle, and then for each of the others, the size of the bicycle fits their needs. So the problem where I started is that we have disparities. The pathway is through the social determinants of health, and our goal is to achieve health equity. If I showed you one slide tonight, it would be this one, and that is that zip code is more important than genetic code. And this is not just a buzz phrase, it's fact. There is no picture of the genetic code for popul on a population basis that has nearly the predictive factor as what zip code you live in. Because the geographic 
uh, there's enormous variability in life expectancy based on where you live. Uh, the reason the life expectancies are so high in this slide from 86 down to 80 is because this is life expectancy for people who've already lived till, till age 65. But it illustrates the point very well uh, that the light, if you look in the poorer parts of the country, which are always concentrated in the South, um, it's easy to see that there's a dramatic difference in the life expectancy compared to the uh, states in the uh, more northern central part of the country. Iowa's looking pretty good. Uh, this is played out at a very local level. This is a slide of Chicago where you'll see dramatic differences in total life expectancy in areas that are very closely uh, linked together. This is data from my own home city of Philadelphia. I just looked it up recently. There's a 15 year difference in life expectancy between the zip codes with the highest and the lowest life expectancy. There are some cities that have even bigger than that, but 15 years is quite substantial. Um, the end of one of the, these zip codes and the beginning of the next are only three miles apart. So just three miles difference, 15 years difference in life expectancy. I am not going to dwell into the solution for every one of these social determinants. And I warned you at the start that although it's not my goal to give a political talk, it's impossible to leave politics, or let me say policy rather than politics, it's impossible to leave policy out of our discussion of the social determinants of health. And I particularly want to highlight what I believe is the single most important one, and that is economic stability. And that's because economic disparity correlates with every major measure of health status, lower educational achievement, lower life expectancy, higher death rates from every major cause, higher obesity, higher smoking rates. So uh, I said earlier, the most important slide I was going to show you was that zip codes more important than genetic code, but I take it back. The next three slides are even more important. So this is what happened to wealth between 1947 and 1979. I showed this recently to someone and I kind of made the case that this was a pretty healthy pattern. The people who started with the lowest quintile of wealth, um, that's this group here, uh, gained the most wealth. They gained 116% of their wealth, um, which is great. Uh, and the, the top 5% gained wealth, but gained the least wealth, only around 80%. So everybody gained wealth in this 30-year period, but the poorer people gained the most. Now, somebody looked at this slide and pointed out that the starting points for the people in these lower quintiles were very, very low. And I think they make a very good point. But at least we were heading in the right direction. Now, let me show you what happened from 1979 forward. In this graph, you see that people who started with the lowest quintile of wealth actually lost wealth from 1979 to 2009. Very little gaining of wealth in the bottom four quintiles, not even that much in the top 20%. Almost all of the growth concentrated in the top 5% and the top 1%. This was from the New York Times graph. Uh, that illustrates it all in one slide. This is what happened uh, to poor and middle class in 1980, used to see the largest income growth. Uh, and the people who were wealthy saw the least income growth. In 2014, exactly reversed. Virtually no growth at the bottom of the wealth scale and unbelievable growth in wealth in the very top 1%. Uh, you know, when you look at these three slides and say, can this possibly support a population-wide support of healthy living? It just can't. At some level, we're going to have to embrace, embrace this. I do want to mention another social determinant, and that's community context. Uh, and specifically discrimination. 32% of African Americans surveyed said that they've experienced racial discrimination at a healthcare provider uh, visit. Uh, 22%, one in five, say they avoid care due to risk of discrimination. Uh, they're an important stressor. They have a big impact on health status. Same thing in the LGBT communities. Uh, provider biases and discrimination uh, may translate into less effective treatment, poor mental and physical health outcomes. Uh, fear of negative responses keeps many LGBT individuals from seeking routine health care, uh, which puts them at risk for uh, late cancer diagnosis. 
Transgender is even greater. One in five transgender patients has been turned away by a healthcare provider, often in the name of I don't have the expertise, but that's not what it feels like to the transgender patient, uh, particularly if it's primary care who, who's not in the, you know, they don't turn patients away, they take patients. Finally, uh, uh, we need to focus on mental health and there's been more and more focus on how important it is to have a healthy early childhood. Uh, and this is so-called trauma-informed care, really reaching back to understand that adverse childhood experiences beginning very early in, in life lead to disruptive neurodevelopment, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, leads to eventual adoption of uh, risky behaviors, disease, disability, and social problems, and ultimately early death. So trauma-informed care is a treatment framework that involves understanding, recognizing, and responding to the effects of all of these types of trauma. It emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety. So given all of these really daunting problems, what is the path forward? Uh, and I don't mean to pretend that it will be easy. It's very difficult, but no problem can be solved if we don't embrace it, appreciate that it's real, uh, and make a commitment to start this journey. So I think we have to begin by understanding the power of these social factors. Uh, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, and the social needs to affect health. Uh, it, it's, understanding them is a very important step, uh, but it can feel, fuel a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. And I think we have to fight off that hopelessness and helplessness. This is under our control. The conditions that produced this were produced by us. Uh, it, it was our nation that produced these conditions, and we're the only ones who can solve it. Uh, so I want to begin by uh, recommending five steps to action. The first one is education. Uh, that's part of what we're doing tonight. The second is owning the problem uh, and the responsibility to reverse these factors. This is we're in healthcare. This impacts health. Uh, or we're, when I say we're in healthcare, we're either providing it or we're we're part of the system. So uh, we we benefit from it. We need it. So it's it's up to us to uh, own it and and be a part of solutions. I mentioned earlier that we need to engage people from every sector. Uh, I can't emphasize enough the role of the business community uh, in saying you know our employees need to be healthy. We need to be a part of the solution. We need uh, more workers. Uh, we need to make sure that people are able to work. Uh, obviously, government, uh, local, state, and national plays a, ro a role. Fourth, we have to embrace equity. This, you know, investing in people who have greater barriers to care uh, more highly uh, than those who don't need that investment. So that's the equity model as opposed to the equality model. This is played out in cancer. When we look at the uh, benefit of having a cancer navigator at the time of diagnosis, patients who uh, are well-educated, have good social support, social network, do very well. They self-navigate. They figure out where they should go for care. It doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, and I really believe every cancer patient needs a navigator. Uh, they either have to be able to self-navigate, which is very difficult. They have a loved one, a friend, a healthcare worker. But people who live alone, have low health literacy, have low resources, for those individuals, we need to actually provide a navigator, and the, the evidence per, uh, supports that. Finally, we need to persevere. We're not going to solve this problem quickly. As I come down to the end of my talk, I want to leave you with some really critical concepts as we think about the solution. And the first one is something that I've learned more about. Uh, and I, I wouldn't, it really is an advance in our thinking about the social determinants of health. Just the way these factors are not biological, they are not inevitable, and they were not accidental. Uh, they derive from, from an upstream event, and those were policy decisions, the so-called political determinants of health. And this book by Daniel Dawes, who I just heard speak recently, uh, called The Political Determinants of Health, uh, has really helped shine a light on what the, 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 our history that has led to the social determinants of health. And this is a, a figure adopted from the book uh, of how did we get here. 
And there is no way to discuss these policies without recognizing that uh, black people, for the most part, came here originally as a part of slavery, which lasted 400 years. As slavery ended, it gave way to Jim Crow segre segregation. Uh, there was research that kind of suggested that blacks were less uh, able or inferior. Uh, and then a whole series of policies that kind of locked in poverty, made it difficult to get out of being poor, uh, made uh, food, healthy food. It, it, it led to segregated neighborhoods with less available food, pharmacies, and hospitals. Uh, uh, gentrification uh, and uh, uh, access to resources. So uh, it, it's a complex system, but uh, that resulted from the big policy and also local and small policies. The second book I would recommend for you is quite recent by Heather McGee. Um, haven't read it all, just have looked at some of it, but it's it's very rated, rated, rated very highly uh, right now as one of the nonfiction books. So I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, Heather McGee is black and has been has been a leader in the black community, but she wrote this book called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And she calls this drained pool politics based on this story from the book and, of course, occurred in real life. The Fairground Park Pool in St. Louis was the largest public pool in the U.S. when it was built in 1919. It had sand from a beach, a fancy diving board, and enough room for 10,000 swimmers. It was dug during a pool building boom when cities and towns competed to provide their citizens with public amenities that promoted civic pride, symbolized a perk of the American dream. These public pools, of course, were for whites only, but when civil rights leaders successfully pushed for them to be integrated, many cities either sold the pools to private entities or, in the case of Fairground Park, eventually drained them close them down for good, drained pool politics. The narrative, and this is from the book, that white people should see the well-being of people of color as a threat to their own is one of the most powerful subterranean stories in America, she writes. Until we destroy the idea, opponents of progress can always unearth it and use it to block any collective action that benefits us all. And then the third book that illustrates this all too vividly, is this book, and these people are white Nobel Prize winning economists from Princeton, called Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, uh, also a best book of the year from 2020. Uh, and what they talk about is that life expectancy in the U.S. was declining before COVID-19, and they talk about the deaths of despair, deaths from alcohol, suicide, and addiction, particularly opioid use, have skyrocketed rocketed. But what they show is that most of this increase is affecting white people who do not have a college education. Thus, they are lower income, higher unemployment, they live with more pain and disability, and they suffer greater social, social isolation. From the book, when bringing education into the fold, oh, I'm sorry, this is not from the book, this is discussing the book, Case and Deaton found the drop in expected years to, uh, to life was for those without a bachelor's degree to live, expected years to live, sorry, I'll start again. When bringing education into the fold, Case and Deaton found the drop in expected years to live was for those without a bachelor's degree. Black men and women with a bachelor's degree who used to have a lower adult life expectancy than whites without a degree now had more expected years to live. This is about all of us. It's not just a race issue, but we also cannot allow race to prevent us and the fact that everyone would benefit from policies equally from, from implementing the policies we need. So I will now end with just a quick comment on what we need to do, I believe, to kind of solve this ultimately. First and foremost, we desperately need to heal as a nation. All of us know this. We've gone through such a difficult period We've never been more polarized with less overlap between the Democratic view and the Republican view. Uh, and, you know, we just have to find a way to come together and heal because it's going to be very difficult to permanently change this sense that we all need to benefit together while we stay so divided. That is number two. We must implement policies that benefit everyone. And when, when I say that, 
Um, it does mean we're going to have to find policies we can accept that tackle income inequality. Uh, four, we must bring our most innovative ideas. We need ideas that people can get behind and embrace. And five, and I could have, I could have spent the whole talk on number five, and I'm happy to do that during discussion. Um, I'm not suggesting that we move away from the very good work that health systems are doing now to help the people who need it the most. That is taking an equity approach. Patient navigation, transportation, financial support, social services, uh, uh, wraparound services, follow-up, uh, providing home care, uh, bridging the economic uh, barriers that people face, making cancer care affordable for the individual, but recognize that as critical as those needs are in helping individuals, uh, if we're ever going to reverse this social determinants, we're going to need upstream solutions. Uh, we have to democratize care. Care is developing and progressing too quickly. Uh, so we can't it's not a realistic expectation that everybody, going back to my very first question, gets to MD Anderson or Dana Farber or Memorial Sloan Kettering or or the health system, uh, the cancer center in your own state. Uh, we need to help community cancer centers have access to the same expertise uh, that can be accessed at the major centers. That's going to be a very daunting goal, and there are some models that are being used. Uh, to try to disseminate this kind of expertise and knowledge. Uh, so all these things, social services, navigation, peer support, economic solutions, uh, they're great. We need to keep doing them. But at the same time, we have to tackle and uh, understand the upstream policies. Because I believe, and I know that you believe, that no one should be disadvantaged in their cancer care because of how much money they make, the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, their gender identity, their level of disability, or where they live. It really been thrilled and honored to speak with you tonight. Look forward to a discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wender. So I'm going to come back on um, lots and lots to think about. Um, before we have a, a conversation, I'm going to share my screen a little bit to uh, share with you the most recent Iowa data that just um, uh, expands on what Dr. Wender uh, reported on. Let's see if I can bring this up. So our um, Iowa cancer or cancer in Iowa report just came out. And let's see, can you see my screen, Rich? We got it. So uh, this is just one slide. So uh, the focus of our 2021 cancer report in Iowa did include uh, disparities. And this is just one slide looking at age-adjusted mortality rates, and the colored bars, the, the dark blue is non-Hispanic white, the red is non-Hispanic black, the teal is Hispanic, and the yellow is others. And for all 10 of the leading causes of death in the state of Iowa, the non-Hispanic black um, uh, are, are leading and have a, a disparate um, representation in all of the deaths. And then I just want to share with you these seven key points. Um, by the way, this is available to any of you if you go to the cancer, the state health registry, and you can download this uh, PDF. So when we look at um, uh, all of cancer in Iowa 2021, um, advancing age is the most important risk factor. We've known that. While the white population has a higher rate of cancer because it's older, Iowa's black population bears the greatest burden of cancer when we account for the differing ages. Iowa's black population has the highest cancer incidence rates between the ages of 50 and 79 whereas Iowa's white population has a highest rate from 80 and older. So cancer is striking the black population at a much younger age compared to the white population. And aside from suicide and liver disease, Iowa's black population has the highest mortality rate in every single major cause of death, including cancers. Some of the largest differences in mortality between the Iowa black and white population include prostate cancer, lung cancer, and liver cancers. Um, Iowa black population also has a higher incidence of colorectal and breast, excuse me, higher mortality for colorectal and breast cancer. 
Black males and black females have a higher cancer mortality rate compared to all other racial and ethnic groups. And uh, cancer mortality rates are declining for each racial and ethnic group. And the difference is narrowing between Iowa's black and white. So that's a, a bit of positive note to, to shine on. I'm gonna stop sharing, but I just point those out to, to show you that Iowa statistics are, are uh, mirror the nations and that uh, we clearly have a country of uh, at least two different societies that are really uh, affected significantly. Um, Rich, to get to your talk, one of the things you talked about that I think is really powerful is the, this difference between equality and equity. So, I mean, it's all fine to say, let's treat everybody equal and everybody gets uh, an equal um, stimulus check and everybody, but clearly it doesn't make sense to, uh, to continue to provide those who have the wherewithal and are, are, have access and have availability to continue to give as many government resources to, to that situation. You gave the example of the bicycle. Another example I heard is, you know, people are trying to watch a baseball game over a fence. And if you gave everybody the same size step, you know, the, the shortest still wouldn't be able to see the baseball game. And those who are advantaged by height would be getting a boost that they didn't need and wouldn't provide them any benefit. Do you want to elaborate more on examples in society as we look toward correcting this disparity of how we use that concept of equity instead of equality to help make some improvements? Yeah. I'm going to give you a very, uh, I, I want you to, everyone to think about this concept very broadly. If you apply this filter to almost every aspect of your job, you'll see this all the time. So I'll give you a really concrete example, one I've lived my whole career, Dick, so you'll relate to it. Uh, I'm a primary care clinician. Uh, there are uh, dramatic data that go back, I mean, they're incontrovertible. Uh, led by a woman named Barbara Starfield at Johns Hopkins, who was a PhD, not a primary care clinician, uh, showing that that uh, societies built on uh, healthcare systems built on a basis of primary care clinicians with, with at least 50% primary care uh, outperform in terms of health outcomes, uh, systems of care based on, based on specialty care. But if you look at the structural determinants of how we pay for care, how we reimburse care, uh, we've we've known this for years, but we feel that there's a certain way people should be paid. You know, they invested in this, and we continue to uh, uh, reimburse in a very unequal way, which in sense all of the behaviors we don't really need. So who who's most likely to get the good care? If you have Medicare, uh, if you have commercial insurance, people who are most able to navigate. That's who people are looking to provide care for, and those people with poorer insurance, less likely. But um, do we have the percentage of primary care clinicians we need and the access we need? We, you know, we have severe shortage and maldistribution. Uh, and I could apply that filter on and on and on. And it, it's easy to see that if you were trying to do this rationally, um, it would look very different. I, I think it really goes back to the 50s, to be honest, Dick, because, um, and I've read a lot about this. There's a book called, uh, I think it's called The American Poison, if I happen to know the name right, somebody can put in the chat, that talks about the economic of our healthcare system and its history. Uh, and there was never a really rational decision to allow healthcare to be managed by the free market, uh, you know, market forces to manage healthcare. It's not done in any other high resource nation in the world. Um, but we've done it here, and it's led to you know everyone kind of in seeking the financial incentives. Uh, there, there, post World War War, employer-based health insurance came in, and you know people were trying to attract it. So th there's a, a, a rich history here. Um, does that mean you know again you always end up being political? Uh, there are ways to blend the combination of uh, commercial insurance, which should not disappear and will not disappear. Uh, with basic uh, rights, you know, basic insurance that covers needs. Uh, final comment, if you look at 
what we spend on healthcare insurance, we spend more than any country in the world. If you look at what we spend on social services, we spend relatively less on social services. So there's lots of very concrete choices, which are frankly within our control. It could make up for some of these gaps. Yeah, and um, I'm interested in uh, what you have seen as models that you think are worthy of replication. So you touched on a little bit. Um, there are some centers that understand that, um, you know, uh, transportation and child care and nutrition, you know, are so vitally important to health. And, you know, it doesn't make sense to, you see a patient, you make a diagnosis, you write a prescription on a little piece of paper and you give it to them and they don't have the, the money to pay for the prescription. They don't have a way to get to the pharmacy and th they're likely not going to benefit from, from the visit. So this um, you mentioned wraparound services. Maybe describe some clinics that you might have seen in your travels that do a good job of bringing in these wraparound social services into the clinic and, and, and think of it not just as writing a prescription for a medicine, but actually providing care. Yeah, I'll, I'll cite two types of models. One is the one that you just cited. Uh, and my, my worry, of, I, I've seen some pretty impressive models. Uh, if you um, are cared for at quite a number of the major cancer centers now, I mean, the moment that you get a diagnosis here at Penn, for example, you are assigned a navigator um, and an assessment of social needs. Uh, and in fact, there are now tools that are embedded in EMR called social determinant tools that um, you can enter the patient's data and you now have recorded a picture of the deter of the barriers they're likely to face. Uh, and you can then uh, pick from a set of services. And there are, again, databases now available that are local where you can see what kind of agencies can help overcome. It's terrific. Uh, and uh, so we know that there are models that can help individuals improve care and that if they get into care at the top centers, they have good outcomes. Um, my worry is there are so many hospitals that are struggling financially and they have trouble figuring out how to afford this. Uh, and again, that's an equity issue. Uh, and then third, if I were just to cite one place, I, I'm gonna give the experience from Duke uh, and Duke in Durham, North Carolina, that really took off their white coats, they stepped out and they, they went and they really engaged and learned from the, from the Durham community. And when they have a healthcare problem, they have a, they're, they're, they're trusted by the black residents of Durham. They say, what's going on? What's happening? What are the solutions? Um, and they were truly responsive. We all have to do community health needs assessments. We have to really take those, it, it's not enough to do them. We have to take those community health needs assessments uh, and bring multiple sectors together, local communities, uh, business, government, to try to tackle some of those root causes. Because I guarantee you what your community health needs assessment says, you're gonna see transportation, you're gonna see food availability, you're gonna see income, you're gonna see uh, chronic disease, you're gonna see opioids, everybody's seeing it in the country. Uh, I will mention Milwaukee. Milwaukee is tackling some of these, bringing all these forces together. They face huge disparities in Milwaukee, but they are taking it seriously. You know, another thing that I wanted to touch upon is that um, this isn't all just uh, do good, liberal, hard on your sleeve, um, that, that, that we're all in this together. And as you pointed out, helping those that are um, in the most disparate populations actually will help the whole population. So instead of pitting it against, well, there's limited resources and if, if uh, population group A gets them, population group won't get them. The truth is, wouldn't our economy be great if, if everyone providing every form of employment was healthy, had access to health care and ability to do what they need to do to be able to, to contribute to all of society at the highest level and, and everyone's ship would yeah. rise. You know, I would encourage you, if you're just gonna read one book of the ones I mentioned, and particularly if you bring a more conservative economic background and view, read, read the last one, Deaths of Despair. It's written by Nobel winning 
uh, prize-winning conservative economists who are just observing that deaths in the white, lower educated population are now the same as blacks. There, there's no disparity there. Suicide mm -hmm. on the rise, opioids on the rise, unemployment, social isolation. Uh, it's all, it's everybody being affected by the same policies. And then they went on to say, what, what should the future of capitalism look like? So um, I think if I were just recommending one, that would be a good one to Great. That's a yeah, great list of books. Um, we just have a few minutes left, and um, our our uh, viewing audience may not know that in in addition to being an outstanding physician, chairman of the Department of Family Medicine, former chief control cancer control officer, uh, you're also an outstanding singer and performer. And I understand that you've actually even created a song about social determinants of health. There you go, uh, Dick. Now, first of all, to the audience, I am not a world-class performer or a great singer, but I bring my passion and, and we sing about the things we care about and uh, use Munich to unify. So thanks, Dick. I'm really happy to do it. I'm going to share my screen and the lyrics one more time uh, to do that. Hang on. I just need my share screen thing. Oh, there it is. finding my uh, the right screen for the video. Sorry about that. Try one more time. See if I can find the right screen. Oh boy. Where does all these music go? Well, I'll tell you what. No problem. Uh, you'll hear me, and you don't need to read the lyrics. I'll read the lyrics. Okay, there we go. We share a health equity dream. We want everyone that we know to join in the efforts we all lead, not accept all the old status quo, to right all unrightable wrongs, find food for all people in need, to work all together as one world to build healthy communities. This is our quest to reach for our goals. We all know that it's hard. We all know our roles to fight for what's right without question or pause. To be willing to listen to all and to work for our cause. And I know if we all can stay true to this critical quest, that we'll see all disparities fall, and then still we won't rest. And our world will be better for this and despair and reduce poverty to join with our neighbors and colleagues to help build healthy community Awesome. <laughs> that this is a first. This is the absolute first. So I, this has been wonderful. Rich, thank you so much for uh, what you have provided us tonight. But better yet, thanks for teaching so many of us these important subjects and helping make the world better. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Thank you so much.
well, I look forward to the day we can see all each other back in Iowa together. Love to do it. That sounds great. We're going to turn it back over to Kendall, who is going to send us off for the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that great information and a phenomenal song too, by the way. Um, and thank you all for tuning in to this week's Cancer Education Series. Be sure to join us next week for another informational session. You can find recordings of all of our sessions on the Mercy One Cancer Education website, which is at mercyone.org slash cancer dash education dash series and on the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel. Have a great night, everyone.